How's everyone? Fresh, good. Hooray. So a mathematician, a physicist, and an engineer walk into a bar. <laughs> and the barman says, what is this, some kind of joke? Hi. Uh, how many people here self-identify as an engineer? That's right. Put your hand down. How many, of, how many of you would be offended if I made a joke at the expense of an engineer? You go, oh, for, OK. I'm sort, this, is sort of, this is sort of terrible behavior I'm displaying right now. All right, so uh, a mathematician and an engineer. This is actually about mathematicians, so it's OK. Uh, a mathematician and an engineer uh, are, are uh, taken to a um, psychology study section, study, study, uh, study. And they're asked to um, enter a room and then solve a problem. And on the first day, the engineer goes first, and he goes in. Uh, she goes in. They go in. Uh, and the, uh, they, they, they say to them, uh, your task is to make a pot of tea. And the room contains a kitchen. And so they find the kettle, they turn on the stove, they fill the kettle with water, they find the tea, they put the tea bag in the cup, they boil the water, they make the tea. Done. And everybody's like, oh, interesting. Good. Say, all right, come back tomorrow. Mathematician comes in, same task, please make a pot of tea. Mathematician looks around, finds the kettle, fills the kettle with water, puts it on the stove, uh, finds the better tea, puts it in the, puts it in the uh, cup. Uh, mathematicians love tea. Uh, boils the water, pours it into the cup, makes the tea. And the psychologist says, oh, curious. OK, come back tomorrow. The next day, the engineer and the mathematician come back. Um, and they say, all right, we're going to put you in this room again. And your task is, again, make, make a cup of tea. So the engineer walks in, but this time the stove is on, the water is boiling, and there's a tea bag in the cup. So they wait for the water. Uh, the water is boiling. They pour the water into the cup, and they made the tea. I'm like, huh? Oh, that's not good. They leave. Uh, the mathematician walks into the room with the same setup. They look around. They take the tea bag out of the cup. They turn off the stove. They pour out the water, put it back in the cupboard, and they say, now we have reduced this to a problem we have previously solved. <laughs> Um, I have a, more, uh, a, a joke that's more derogatory towards engineers, but on the fly I decided that was a bad idea. So <laughs> we, can, we can maybe... Can you ask how many people self-identify as mathematicians? I feel like this is complimentary to mathematicians, <laughs> honestly. How many people self-identify as mathematicians? Was that offensive? Maybe a little bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I apologize. It's, it's true. <laughs> you said it's actually true. That's yeah, terrible. Well, I see. I said it's true. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we get going on lecture three, which is basically my plan for lecture two, but I've rearranged things so we'll still get to what I think are the fun modern concepts um, that I want to talk about tomorrow on uh, intro, intro to information bottleneck and how to add whatever you, whatever you believe is relevant to the system to your constrained optimization problem. So we're still going to get to that tomorrow. The stuff that we have cut. Um, has to do with some kind of uh, going over the mean results of Shannon's information theory, so going over the source coding theorem and the channel coding theorem. I will give you a lightning fast introduction to those things, um, but uh, if you want to know more, you should really read um, David Mackay's book and watch his lectures online because they're entertaining and really intuitive, um, and you can put them at 1.5 speed and get through them really quickly. Mackay, uh, Mackay, Mackay, I believe. Yes. I shall maintain that that is correct. Okay, when we got into the information in spike trains yesterday, um, we spent a lot of time discussing swapping the stim average for the time average, and I just wanted to take a second to recap um, in case some of the kind of basic ideas got lost in some of the algebra I was doing at the board. So what we were trying to compute was the mutual information between some stimulus, which I called M, the message that's being sent down the neural channel, and the response of the neuron. And here, I've, I've, I've been a little bit better about it. I'm saying sigma. This is a binary variable at 0 or 1. And that, like we said, is just a reduction in uncertainty. So here's the entropy of the stimulus, the message, minus p log p, sum over all the, the bins of the message. And then here's, 
here's the uh, reduction in that uncertainty we have by observing the spikes or silence. So this is just a sum over the conditional P of message given sigma, where sigma is just 0 or 1. Now, the, the trick that we did that made these, this equation long and it sort of made it run into the edge of the board, which is why I said go look at the LaTeX notes because it's all written out, is that we used Bayes' rule to substitute P of message for sigma for P of sigma given message. And the reason we were doing that is oftentimes in biology experiments, we repeat a stimulus many times and we get a measurement of a response given that, given that message. So that's why we wanted to swap this around. We, we compute this sort of automatically when we repeat trials. And then we needed the probability of a message, and we needed the probability, overall probability, of the response. So this is saying, you know, how much, uh, how much here does observing the response of our neuron or of our biological system reduce our uncertainty about the message? Then, dot, 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 we swapped this stimulus average for a time average, and we had a long discussion about whether or not that was valid and what that meant for uh, being ergodic. Then we took a uh, time step to zero because we swapped stim for time, then we took very narrow time bins, and we arrived at this uh, equation where um, this is just saying we've got a sum over time. I've left delta t in here because you can still sum over discrete time bins, and what's happened is that we've said this is the probability per unit time of, of seeing a spike, a sigma equals 1. So this is what's usually called the firing rate of the neuron, the, and the instantaneous firing rate of the neuron, and that's in spikes per second, just to get the units there. So when we multiply by delta t, we get the probability of spiking in that window. And then we had the ratio of how much that firing rate is modulated by the stimulus over its mean, okay, here. And so the bigger that, what we call signal to noise ratio is, the more information we have, and we use log because Shannon taught us that that's the right way to look at uncertainty. Yes. And the mean was also a time, a time this is a time. Uh, this is a time average. This R bar again. Yes, very good. And you asked me this last time, and it was a good thing to ask then too. R bar is the time average of R of t. Okay. And the reason that the complementary term here dropped out about the probability of not a spike is that we took these time bins to be small. And we know that the firing response of neurons is, is sparse. They don't, they don't sort of fire all the time and then briefly pause. They mostly don't fire and then briefly fire. So those pauses, um, when you take time bins very small, carry, uh, carry zero information. But that's something, if you're doing a calculation, you should always check. You should always check. Okay, this information is in bits. You see the log 2 here? This is in bits. And bits, oh yeah, Simon. Right, so, so th this, is a, this is a really good question. So up here, what we're, what we're averaging over here is either uh, the presence or absence of, of, of the spike. You're exactly right about that. And what we want to know is um, how, what the entropy of the message is given the spike. And basically what I'm saying here is that given that there's no spike, the entropy of the message is not reduced. So we're going to have something that's like P of spike times something that has some, 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 some good weight to it, times p of no spike, times the, pro times the entropy of the message. And so it's, it's, going, it's going to approximate that we're getting something that's like the entropy of the message minus the entropy of the message for the no spikes, and the entropy of the message minus, minus something small for the spikes. Now the probability of spiking gets small, so you have to actually work through this calculation to see how much there is. But you're exactly right. What we're saying is that um, for these sparse events, it's the timing of the events that carry information about the stimulus. And um, basically, when, when the neuron fires a spike at some particular time in the stimulus, we now know sort of what time it was. So imagine that you have a, a neuron 
that only fires once in the whole long stimulus trace because maybe it only cares about, you know, sort of, well, maybe it fires a few times, but it only cares about a, a very sparse set of uh, features of the stimulus. If you observe the spiking of that neuron, you know pretty precisely where you were. Now, it turns out that you don't know anything about the other times, so you, don't, so you might need many neurons to get information. Now, you, this is in bits. So you would think that, okay, if I see multiple spikes from my cell, can I get more information? Maybe, maybe not, because those spikes could be redundant with each other. And this is agnostic about whether or not their information is additive. And so then it's important to put different symbols in and ask that question directly. Okay. So this was in bits. It's actually in bits per bin. It's, it's, it's not really a unit. It's just bits, but whenever we're binning something up and we're calculating an information, it's sort of bits per those bins we made for the response. Now, um, in the Brenner et al. paper, you'll often see this, and they'll just call it i. And this is bits per spike. So it's the same i divided by r bar delta t. So that's how many spikes you get on average per bin. This is max one bit, because we just have binary, a binary thing. This can have, you know, be more than one bit, which is, I think, intrinsically confusing. So I really like to just calculate this, and I know it should go between zero and one. Bits per spike also might lead you to think, well, if I observe multiple spikes, I should get to add all this up. But we just said it might not be true. Things might be redundant. People also do something else. They divide this i by just delta t. And that gives you bits per second. And folks do this a lot, I think, who are using information as a sort of figure five part of their paper. Because if you calculate bits per delta t and you take delta t small, this gets really big and seems impressive. 50 bits per second. And then you have to ask, were these time bins independent? Is it actually uh, an information channel where I'm, you know, I'm pushing things through, but what's the capacity of that channel? And that's important. So I wanted to go over this just so you have a little bit, um, I'm going to be very ginger with this, just so you have a, a, a little bit of a decoder on, on this. So um, do please go through those LaTeX notes if you would like to dig into the details of this calculation. And if you find anything confusing, please just ask me some more. OK. Now, um, we are going to go ahead and move on to uh, an introduction to max entropy and efficient coding in single neurons. And I'm going to show you the mechanics of how to calculate things for these sorts of problems. Does anybody have any questions lingering on this before we move on? All right. Good. OK. <laughs> OK. So what I want to, oh, I set this up for myself nicely. OK. So what I want to talk about now is how we maxim maximize entropy and, and efficient coding in single neurons. Um, this has a long and storied history that goes all the way back to Claude Shannon and Weaver. Um, and this mathematical theory of com communication should be in your readings folder under my mini course. Um, and it's actually a very readable paper. It's something you can kind of sort of light, light reading. It's fun. Um, well, I mean, they're equations. But it's not like field theory, if that makes sense. Um, then other folks had some ideas um, about how this might apply to neuroscience. And what they were saying was that perhaps it's the case that because of the constraints that biological systems have in you know, how, how big they can be, how many fibers you can send down your optic nerve. Maybe the way that the retina or your auditory system has encoded the information about the outside world is optimized for transmitting as much information as possible down that limited channel. So these ideas um, of efficiency uh, came around early in the game um, when we were just starting to, as, a, as a community, um, just starting to be able to record uh, from uh, neurons. Uh, the, the hard thing about neurons is that you have to catch them in action. You can't look at sort of dead fixed brains and get much out of it.
because like we said, all of the signaling is electrical and chemical, and if you fix the tissue, you, you, you can't really learn anything from the structure. And I say that, maybe that's a bit provocative, maybe I'm dissing on the whole you know, connectome thing. <laughs> but what, yes, um, I think I think that I think that there's certainly something we can learn from the connect, from the wiring diagram of the brain. It it has to be informative. It has to be exciting and interesting. But we've been shown again and again that the ways that neurons compute information in a population are really dependent on their functional state um, and their and their dynamics, which you don't get from just wiring diagrams. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna, uh, this is a brief slide as a teaser to say, okay, let's recall some basics of information theory and then look at uh, sending signals down a noisy channel, but we're gonna do this together, okay? All right. Da, 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 da. Uh, uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I just looked at my notes and saw information in spike trains and was horrified um, because it was the wrong thing. All right, um, let's start here. I'll leave that up for a little while. I'm going to start over here. Um, let's imagine that our neural response R is some function of the messages that we're getting from the outside world. So it's some f of m. And let's take for a minute that this function of the message is a Gaussian channel. And what do I mean by that? I mean that there is some function of the message, which now I'm calling phi. And this is in some arbitrary, nonlinear thing, can be what it wants, plus some noise. And when I say it's a Gaussian channel, I mean that this noise is additive, obviously, and it's Gaussian, so it's drawn from a distribution with zero mean and uh, variance sigma squared. Not to be confused with our binary variable. This is a variance. Uh, should we call it something else? No, we'll leave it. OK. So the question here is, what if we want to maximize uh, this quantity, the mutual information between R and M? And again, I'm using capital letters for the ensemble and lowercase letters for the particular instance here. OK, so what if we want to maximize the mutual information between the response and the message? And this is, uh, this is the idea that uh, Barlow and others had. And you also have a paper from Barlow in the, in the readings list, um, is that maybe the brain does this. Maybe given whatever noise there is in the brain, the brain maximizes the information that the responsive neurons have about the signal. So how do we, how do we write this down? What is this? Well, it's the entropy of one of those things minus the entropy of it given, given the other, right? So let's write it down this way. We know we can write it. We know we can, it's symmetric. So we could start with the entropy of the response or the entropy of the stimulus. I'm going to say, let's start with the entropy, entropy of the response, OK? That's uh, my, my prior you know, sort of range of things I say in general. And what do we subtract? Yes. Entropy of R given M. OK, all seems pretty good. So what is this? So this is entropy of R. And what is R? R is phi of M plus Z. And let's write this down for a particular message. And then let's average over messages. Okay. So R is phi of M plus C. Now, if we have a particular message, this is just a number. It's not a distribution. It's just, for that particular message, this is just a number. It turns out that the entropy is a measure of the shape of the distribution. 
and does not depend on the mean. I give that to you as an exercise, and I'm happy to show you how to prove that to yourself. But I want you to try it. So what I'm saying here is that this is just a number. This is a distribution over z that I've shifted by a number. Okay. This is a stochastic variable. This is just this is defined by the message. This is noise. So I'm going to say that this is equal to the entropy of z. And this is because of the translation invariance of entropy. Yeah, Caroline. Yes, there is, a u there is a unique mapping. Yes. Yes, very good, thank you. We have not said that, but now we have. OK. Um, yes. So why would that be is absolutely still deterministic. We'll need to invoke the fact that phi of m is monotonic in a second, and, and it, 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 it will be one to one. So if m gave you multiple phi's, if phi of m, if, if your response phi of m had multiple phi's, that could be a problem because then this wouldn't, it, would, it wouldn't be deterministic. There could be multiple numbers. And if, uh, and if you got the same number for multiple m's, we could have problems later. Mm -hmm. Then there's a potential that I could lose space by uh, by mapping multiple m's to the same value of phi. That's right. That's right. So that's so if you have right, you don't have so there's a couple things. We need phi to be defined for all m. Yes, good. We need phi not to have multiple values for one m, and we need not to have multiple uh, m's mapped to the same phi. OK. All right. So z doesn't depend on m. We said the whole point of the Gaussian channel is that it is noise. It is independent of m. So now we have that the mutual information between our response and our message is the entropy of the response minus the entropy of the noise. OK. We are stuck with this. In this example, we are stuck with this. That means we can't change it. So how are we going to maximize this? Very good. We're going to maximize the entropy of our response. How do we maximize something? We take a derivative, we set it equal to 0, we figure out what it is. Right? OK, so let's go through an example. So uh, I'm going to tell you that for discrete variables, the uniform distribution has the maximum entropy. That may How many of you find that intuitive? Good, right? You have a certain number of states. To have the maximum entropy, you want to use all those states equally. If you prefer one, you kind of know something a priori about which state should come out, and you've kind of lost the power in that variable. So let's just run through that calculation. Are there any questions about this right now? This is very simple, but I want to make sure the concepts are like in there. OK. So let's do this part together. So I have, let's say my response is just some sum over states. sum over states. I need to maximize this, but I have to keep track of one really simple constraint. And that constraint is that this probability distribution had better sum to 1. Right. OK? 
So if I want to maximize this entropy with this constraint, what should I do? Very good, Saloni. Lagrange multiplier. Method of that one. So here's the thing I'm going to maximize. I'm going to maximize S of R. And Lagrange multipliers is just the add zero trick. I mean, that's the way I like to write it. It makes sense to me. So I put this bookkeeping variable out in front. And this is the thing I want to equal 0. OK, good. So now what are we going to do? Now we're going to take derivatives. And now you, should, you might start to feel a little queasy. No? Good. OK, so take a derivative. What are we going to take derivatives with respect to? Well, we're going to try to modify p of r i. So we're going to try to pull on all these little p of r i's. So functional derivative, which is why I wrote it with the deltas. It's going to turn out here that nothing inside the entropy depends on p prime. So by Euler-Lagrange, we can just do regular partial derivative. OK, what is that? Everybody write it. Take one, take, take one minute and write down that derivative for me. We're taking the derivative with respect to some particular p of ri. I know it's early. This is to like wake you up. I'm a theorist. I'm not awake either. I just fake it. Very carefully. Ah, very carefully. <laughs> OK, uh, 10 seconds. Does anybody want the chalk? Nobody is running to the board, so I'm going to write this down. Uh, does anybody want to tell me what to write down? So, OK, from the first term, we've got first times the root of the second plus the second times the root of the first. So p of ri, what's the derivative of log p of ri? 1 over p of ri. So what's the integral of d cabin over cabin? Where's Freya? Log cabin. Very good. Thank you. OK. All right. So we've got a minus p of ri over p of ri. This turns out that's harder than I had before. Um, second part, we've got a derivative of uh, p of ri, and then we got the log. OK, and what do we get from the constraint? The way I've written it down, we get a plus lambda, right? We set this equal to 0. And then let's solve for p of r i. So first of all, this is 1. OK. Now let me stop. I'm going to stop torturing myself, and I'm going to write down here. OK. So let's solve for p of r i. This is very sad. We're just waking up together. This isn't supposed to be challenging. Don't think it's tricky. Very straightforward. We get that p of r i is e to the, I got 1 minus lambda, right? So what did I do? I have this log, and I have to exponentiate both sides to get an expression for p of r i. This is really simple, and you can already see that it doesn't depend on r. This is a constant. Now what is that constant? We could plug this back into our constraint equation and figure it out. And what we'll get is that e to the 1 minus lambda is 1 over n. So p of ri is 1 over n. So it's a constant with a normalization factor, where n is the number of bins. n bins. Good, right? That makes sense. Two bins. p is a half a half. Three bins. p is a third, a third, a third. Seven bins. Blah, 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 so on and so forth. 
The reason I'm taking the time to write this down is because whenever you maximize an entropy, whenever you maximize an entropy, you're going to pull down a log. You're going to pull down a log of p of r. And you're going to want to solve for p of r, so you're always going to take an exponential. And your exponential is going to contain factors that have to do with your constraints. Here's the lambda. Yeah? Is it? Did I get it backwards? It's quite possible. I could also take a minus sign through. <laughs> you want to do that? Yeah. Is that better? Good. So I take the lambda minus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Very good. Doesn't really matter. We'll get that. Just depends on which way you wrote, wrote that round. But good, good catch. OK. So every time I have this derivative of an entropy, I'm going to get a log. I'm going to get a log. That means I'm going to take an exponential to solve for p of r. And then in the exponential, I'm going to have my constraints. Yes. I said, I, when we set up this problem, we said that we have a discrete number of states. This, is, this, is, this problem only works for a discrete number of bins. This, this, this histogram equalization. We already know what sort of response values we can have and how many they are. And we want to know how to maximize the entropy. And the answer is just we should do, we should make, we should make a uniform distribution over, but we know what these states are. Yep. If we make this continuous and we put some limits on it, then you get different answers. Um, and I'm going to tell you about those right now. So here we got that it's a constant. And, and when people say when you solve maximum entropy distributions, they come from an exponential family, this is all they're saying. That because when you take a derivative of an entropy, you get a log, and then you're, you, you, you want to find this, that's the thing you can vary, you get solutions that are from an exponential family. And the exponential family will have in its exponent the sum of the constraints that you put on the problem. So how could we make this more elaborate? Well, we could, we could say p of r is continuous, and let's just say it has to be greater than 0, and let's constrain the mean. This is useful in neuroscience because you, know, you can't always just use all of your response bins equally. Neurons sometimes silent more than they spike, and you maybe can't push a neuron beyond some mean rate. So you might want to say, OK, its response rate can be anything positive, but it, has to be, it's, it can't go beyond some mean. And if you constrain positive continuous response and a mean, you get an exponential for your maximum entropy distribution. If instead you say, ah, I can have any response. It's a real valued number. I have a mean that's constrained, but my variance is also constrained. I can't have arbitrarily high response and, or arbitrarily low. I, sort of, I, have a, I have a mean and a variance. Can you guess what kind of distribution you get if you have a mean and a variance term here? It's a Gaussian. It's a Gaussian, yes, yeah, yeah. The Gaussian distribution is a maximum entropy distribution for constrained mean and variance, where you, let, you range between minus infinity and plus infinity. Those problems are in the very short homework set I gave you um, for uh, last lecture, but that's OK. We didn't get to it. OK. So we just did, uh, we just did the fact that if we have a discrete number of states, we get a uniform distribution. And now I want to go back to our original problem, the information in this um, Gaussian channel and talk about what happens. Oh. Chalkboard interlude. There we go. Uh, what happens um, when, we, when we have a particular stimulus distribution? OK. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. So I'm going to come over here and use this board. Give me one second. Is Dakota or Leo Dakota or Leo here? Mm -hmm. 
OK. So let's imagine that we're back here. Our response is some nonlinear input plus noise. So this is a Gaussian channel. And we've said that if we, if we max info, we're going to have that P, and let's assume we have some discrete states, we're going to have that P of Ri is just 1 over n. Now let's write that in terms of, say, the firing rate of a neuron. So let's say the bins go from, say, maybe a 0 to R max, a max response rate and they have bins of size delta r. So this, that's in, r is in uh, spikes per second from the neuron. So we're going to say that this is like delta r over r max. So there are n of these bins. So n is r max over delta r. Good. OK. So that's our p of r. It's a constant. It's just delta r over r max. And that's, again, saying that our neuron has a set of discrete response bins between some 0 and some maximum. And that's what we've set up. Now what we want to do is figure out what the heck this should be. Okay. What should that be? This, remember, is our nonlinear input-output function. We get a message from the outside world. And this is how we respond to it, subject to noise that we can't control. Subject to noise that we can't control, we know that the best thing we should do is make our response distribution flat. But we're stuck with P of M. We don't get to control that. That's set by the external world. That's set by nature, our environmental niche, something like that. So we don't get to set that. So this is fixed. So we want to know what, uh, <laughs> I made a funny sound, <laughs> what should phi m be um, to max this? That's the question we're ask asking. So the first thing I'm going to do is that we're going to live in a small noise a small noise approximation for now. We're going to assume that the noise is not so, so, so big um, that it swamped, completely swamps the signal. So we're going to hope that biology has given us a channel that's somewhat decent. Okay? And so we're going to start with a continuity con condition. We're going to say for some small change in the external message, there's some probability of that message. So some probability of message, and then we, we make a small change. We're going to assume we have a continuity condition so that this is equal to P of R delta R. OK. Good. So that's our continuity condition. So now we have a particular P of R. We have a particular P of R. Let's, OK, let's just write this out a little bit more. So we've got P of M delta M equals P of R, P of R, and delta R. What's our change in response? Our change in response as we change M. Well, that's phi of M plus delta M minus phi of M. Now here I've dropped the noise. So either we're assuming the noise is small and this little step is sm the noise is small on the time scale of this little step. So it's the same and it cancels. Because otherwise this is a little bit hard to understand. It's a stochastic variable with mean 0, so this is also maybe OK with you. But we're in the small noise approximation here. So what I've said is that there's some delta r in response to delta m. And it looks like this. Looks like the change in my input-output function. OK. So now we know what this should be to maximize the info, right? 
So to max info for discrete bins, what should this be? It's written on the board. Uh, I, yep, it's written on the board. What is that? That should be a constant. We should do histogram equalization. And that should be delta r over r max. Good? So let's plug that in. So now we have p of m delta m equals delta r over r max. And now we have phi of m plus delta m minus phi of m. Now, we're going to assume that, that phi assumption. We're going to assume phi of m is monotonic in m. Otherwise, we might need some absolute value here or something like that. And you can see what I want to do. Hopefully, you can see what I want to do. What I want to write down over here, I want to take this delta m over there. Oh, I don't know what this is. What am I doing? Hanging parentheses. OK, so p of m times r max, that's just some number, over delta r, right? I hear whispering. Is something not clear? Ah, OK, hold on a second. Ah, shoot. OK, p of r, this is the probability density. I wondered why I had this den uh, delta r as a probability density. P of r is a probability density. So if you're worried about why there's another delta r in here, this is capital P of r, which is the probability per bin divided by the bin size. Apologies for that. This is just one. What are your questions? So what I'm saying here is this is, this is in a very, very small delta R window. So this is a pro not a probability per bin. This is a probability density. So this is, this is the probability per bin. And this is the probability density, the probability per unit response. So that's where that delta R went. OK, so now if I take the R max over here and the delta M over there, I get phi of m plus delta m minus phi of m all over delta m. What does that look like to you? A derivative. Yay. Looks like a derivative. All right. Very good. So what do we have? Let's put this up. I'll give this back to you in just a second. <coughs> <laughs> d phi dm is equal to r max p of m. Remember, we're trying to solve for phi of m. So what should we do to this? What's the, what's the inverse of a derivative? Integrate. So we've got to integrate this. Integrate both sides. And we're going to integrate from some m min to our current m. And I'm going to make this kosher by putting a prime in there. OK. So let's write that out. That means that we should get phi of m, phi for our current m, and this is where it was important that uh, phi was monotonic, equals r max. And then we just have an integral. I don't know what P of, M, P, of M, P of M is. M min to M. P of M prime D M prime. OK. This is what we get. Let me throw this up top gently. <laughs> OK, that says, 
not only now do we know how we should arrange our responses to get max info, we now know what our input output function should be. Hugo. Oh, our max. Ah, we just said that we have so many response bins. And all I said is that there's, we have so many response bins. And I just said that they went from 0 to r max in steps of delta r. It's just my way of putting units back on this. Yeah, so this might be 0 spikes per second to 100 spikes per second in units of 10 spikes per second fixed number of your maximum response rate. It could be molecules per second, molecules per ATP, something like that. Uh, more questions I saw. Simon, I saw Isabella, I saw Caroline, I saw Janki, and others. So let's do them in that. Simon, Isabella, Carolina, Caroline, <laughs> Janki, thank you. Uh, no, it's still it's still here in how we're integrating this up. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, so you're, you're right. I could just have said that at the end. If phi is monotonic, this all falls through. If phi goes back down, then this is weird. Isabella. Yeah. Right, right, right. Here, let me, let me, this is a really good question, and you're having a good insight, so let's talk about it for a second. Um, I'm going to write the mutual information between the message and the response again, and we said that that was the entropy of the response minus the entropy of the noise. Right? And we said that to maximize this, we need to maximize our response entropy. But our response entropy, so we know that we want to equalize our response entropy, but our response is hidden. Our response is a response to the stimulus. And so the distribution that we get will be set by the distribution of messages we get. So what we're trying to figure out now is how do we set up that input-output function so that at the end of the day, we get a uniform response. It's, it's hidden in there. The response contains the message. Caroline. Yes, absolutely, I can. Absolutely. So when I said the probability is uniform, I asked, so say that we have these five bins up here, uh, six. I said, what is this number? And it's just p is 1 over the number of bins, which is just r, it's, the number of bins is r max over delta r. So 1 over the number of bins is delta r over r max. That's the probability per bin, right? Now, when I make this little tiny delta r step, it might be like this, where I'm inside the bin, but I want a probability per unit response. I want a probability density. I want to change this into a probability density. So I want to, this is like a capital P, and I want to make a probability density, which is going to be this capital P over delta r. So I have a probability per unit response. I want to get rid of this here. And that's why when I had when I had P of R delta R, I had to have little P of R, which was capital P of R over delta R. So it's delta R over R max divided by delta R. So I just got 1 over R max here. And that's got units of 1 over, you know, kind of spikes per second, instantaneous firing rate. Uh, Janki. Yeah, um, if this is the local connection function, is this, so I think it works, from what I understand, it would work backward, which is if yes. we want to maximize information, which is what the response, um, which is the form the response. Yes. Stimulus, yes. Is this, and also given constraints. Yes. Yes. We are going to we are going to in a minute be amazed by some data from the fly. And um, if uh, hopefully. Falls apart, what part of it falls apart? Ah, 
lots of things. Um, this is a very simple calculation. We, we did it soup to nuts in a couple chalkboards and like two pages of notes. What can fall apart? We had additive Gaussian noise. Simple, simple, simple. What if the noise depends on the, what if the sort of fluctuations depend on the stimulus in some complicated way? What if it's not additive? What if it's multiplicative? This isn't quite the same either. Um, what if, what if you're, what if you have other constraints we haven't considered here? I think that's the most important thing that I want to convey to you about information theory and neuroscience. This is kind of the old school way of thinking about maximizing information in a channel, where you make some assumptions about the channel, but they're pretty basic. Additive Gaussian noise, pretty basic. It turns out biology is complicated. And the other assumption here is that you just want to maximize the information between the message and the response. It turns out that the outside world, you might not need to know everything about it if you're a biological or organism. You might have behavioral goals. You might have uh, computational goals in that particular system. So representing the whole mes message might not be what you want. This is kind of like a physicist thinking, OK, I'm going to engineer a channel. How should I make that channel so that I get everything out of my external world as possible? So that's, those are the ways this falls apart. Absolutely. Does that, is it complementary to this, or does it in any way? It's, a, it's, it's an excellent question that, and that goes straight into the channel coding theorem and how much information rate you need. What's the minimum information rate you can, what's sort of the maximum amount of information you can shove through a channel given that you've got some constraint on how much you lose? So we're going to talk about the adding that in. Um, Right. And other, other constraints you might have, you might not have, you not, might, not, might not be able to drive a neuron to a uniform distribution. That was also a simplification that made this math really easy. Um, and you might, have, you might have other terms. You might have other terms in this constrained optimization problem. OK. Uh, I lost track a little bit of who's next. But I think you are next. And tell me your name again. Julia. Julia. Yeah, we are assuming that your neuron has a max response rate, and it's set um, that you, in this ensemble of messages you're receiving, that's fixed. So it'll vary. The response you give will vary by the message, but the, we're we're saying that the in this ensemble, this is the max, and it's one number. Thank you, Julia. Okay, uh, Ahmed, do you still have a question? Yeah, I mean, I was just uh, what uh, I wanted to respond to what Simon was saying. Okay. out that phi is an integral of some uh, some positive function, which or uh, what some positive function. The probability is definitely a positive function. Right. So, so uh, I mean, there's an issue of assigning that you. Uh, this is the second point. Uh, let's just focus on the first point. So the, the, for this, is a monotonic function. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the issue is there are so so then he is saying therefore we do not require phi to be uh, one to one. No, we still phi has still has to be one to one. Way way back. No, no, but he's saying it doesn't have to be monotonic. Not having to be monotonic means it doesn't have to be one to one. Part also part of the point here is that here I've got a phi of m plus delta m minus m. I've sort of implicitly assumed that that's positive. Yeah, Go ahead. I think that's the point. You, you need monotonic and monotonicity of phi of m to write delta r as delta phi. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Here here is the point. I said it here. And maybe it got buried a little. But I, I've implicitly said that phi of m plus delta m is bigger than phi of m. I'm taking a little step forward. Avnish? No, it's OK. Uh, Han Rong. Yeah. Yes. Ah, uh, sorry. I, yo, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about to make it's I've, I'm skipping a step. This is good. To make P of R uniform. And that 
will maximize the information. Very good. Very good. We've unpacked it. Tell me your name again. Angelica. Angelica. Okay, good. I've, 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 I, think I've, I think I've now got everybody. I think I go down the row. Yes. No, it's something that's given to you by the world. Because those are the messages, those are the stimuli from the external world. So let's, let's maybe have a look at some data, OK? Let's, let's ha have a look at some data. So, um, uh, and these, these notes, um, with some caveats about taking functional derivatives and all of that, um, are written up under like SCP note sufficient coding on the um, course website. So you can find those. Um, and those are clean. I'm, I'm going to get these scanned as soon as I find Dakota. OK. So what, we, what, this says, what this says is that your input-output function is the cumulative density function of the probability distribution of your external world. So another caveat. Where can we measure this? Well, let's hope that this variable is 1D, because then we kind of can get into it. So here. Here's, uh, some, here's an illustration of that. So what this says is that if this is the probability distribution on top of, say, intensities of some external variable, it's going to be visual, so this is going to be like a luminance. If it's Gaussian, my CDF of a Gaussian looks like a sigmoid, right? And what this theory says is that your input-output function should be this. It should be the CDF of your input distribution if you want to maximize information in your channel. And lo and behold, if you go into a blowfly, nice big flies, right? The ones that they're the um, carrion flies that you see all around, big eyes. You can record in the retina from the lamina from large monopolar cells. They're called large monopolar cells because they have big diameter and you can, you can um, record from them without too much trouble um, in an intact fly. Beautiful thing about the fly visual system is that there are pieces of the brain where you can get access to really fine channels of neural encoding um, for hours and hours and hours. I've seen uh, Rob de Reuter, who was um, a student of Laughlin's back in the day, record from a blowfly H1 neuron, a horizontal, sensing neur horizontal motion sensing neuron for days by feeding the fly, by you know, sort of kind of gluing it into a straw and then feeding it every day while it had this big electrode in the back of its head. Crazy. OK, a little grim. Um, so what we have here, what we have here in the solid line is the cumulative, is the CDF of the luminance contrast distribution in natural scenes. So what did Simon do? He went out and he looked at the natural scene statistics in like fields and forests. You can get a contrast distribution for that. He plotted the CDF of that contrast distribution. And then the dots with the error bars, that's the input output function from the fly large monopolar cells, some of the earliest cells in the fly visual system. Now he's done a bit to align them around 0. But other than that, I think you can see that the shape is in pretty tight agreement. So this paper is also in your readings if you want to dig into it more. This is pretty remarkable stuff. Um, this is one of the early triumphs of theoretical neuroscience. He said, I have a notion that neurons should be efficient. If they're efficient, they should maximize their response entropy. If they have just a discrete number of states, that means that should be a uniform distribution. If that's true, to make that uniform, their input-output function better be the cumulative density function of their input stimulus distribution. Now let's go measure the natural world and see if these things line up. So these two are independent measurements. And I do agree. Yes, Michael. Yeah. Are there examples in the natural world of where you don't like, have a Gaussian input? Yes. And then does it hold very well for those as well? Um, so uh, this is about efficient efficient coding of natural scene stats. And it does seem like you get this back a remarkable, to a remarkable extent. And um, usually in visual systems, for the most part, is where I know of good examples, um, where kind of representing everything that's out there makes you competitive with your, uh, with your neighbors. Um, Pansy. 
Oh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, the I think I think I understand where. Okay, let me let me let me try to clean this up a little bit. I've used delta r twice, and I think that's the problem. So r max is your max response rate. Say your neuron can only have zero spikes or 100 spikes per second. R max is that 100 spikes per second. I'm going to say that my response bins, you know, so the number of of independent states I have in my response is maybe chunked in 10 spike per second spins. So I'm either 0 to 10 spikes per second, 10 to 20 spikes per second, 20, and that's that delta R. That's a big bin size delta R. We should, then this is a little dr. This is a little dr. And I gave them the same delta, and that was maybe where the confusion is coming in. Yeah? Yeah, we should fix that. Um, OK, so when I did this continuity condition uh, up there, I said P of M delta M is P of R delta R. And that was not that bin size. That was a tiny little step. And that's, that's, that's what I should have fixed. So then I wrote it down as phi of m plus delta m, a little shift in delta m minus phi of m, because I'm going to turn that into a derivative. And then my probability per unit, per unit response was, was p of r, the delta r over r max, divided by the bin size, because it's a probability density. That delta r is the big delta r. So I should have called this, I should have called this, Let's call this a little dr, and we could call this dm, and then we'll be happier. That was a really good question. Good catch. Grace. Uh, sorry, I know you asked that this already, but I missed it. Uh, could you briefly explain the beta on the chart? Oh, absolutely. There are two separate data sets. Two separate data sets. So the solid line is um, Simon and Laughlin going all, out into the natural world and measuring like with a camera, the contrast in natural scenes and the distribution of observed contrast. So you could take a bunch of pictures if you have a really good calibrated camera and, and do that, or take a photo PMT out and, and do something really good, spectrophotometer, something like that. Um, and the solid line is, um, so he's made a probability density function of all of those contrasts he observed. So contrast is relative to the mean luminance. What are your deviations look, what do your deviations look like? So if I take a photograph, I have a mean, and it's black and white, I have a mean, you know, grayscale value from 0 to 255, right? And then I look at all the, de I look at the distribution of deviations around that mean. That's what this solid line is. It's the cumulative density function of that distribution, and it's roughly, that distribution is roughly Gaussian. Then what the, what the dots and error bars are is Simon showing those contrasts in the lab to a fly and measuring the output firing rate for those different values from the large monopolar cell in the fly, which you can hit because they're so big by setting an electrode into the fly eye. And so he went out and measured the world. Then he showed the world to the fly and measured at its input output function. He had a theory about how those should be related, and it held up. People do this a lot. They try to um, measure their statistics of natural scenes. When ping. The response is it like say it say it again. Integral feedback control. I don't know. No. It's not uh, can you say why you think that? Maybe I can answer the question a little better instead of just saying no. <laughs> Yeah. It's an integral, though, of it's, 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 not, it's not that the neuron is integrating the contrasts from here to there. It's responding instantaneously to a particular contrast. And it happens to be that the distribution of contrasts set how you need to sort of uh, fix your response strength. So this is an instantaneous response to one contrast. And then he, then he puts a different contrast in and measures response, then a different contrast in. So it's not an, there is a time scale of that response, but this isn't integrating over a lot of present. This isn't an, a contrast signal that's varying a lot, and you're integrating over a ton of it up to this. You have to be kind of integrating up to this level. It, it, it's not quite that. Liam. 
Please be obnoxious. I invite you. Yes. Oh, this is a fantastic. I love this question. This is not an obnoxious question. This is dear to my heart. So what, sci what, what, what was done in this study was to say a natural scene is what's outside that's not buildings. Exactly, on what scale? So Simon knew something about the optics of the fly eye, so he took pictures at the right scale. People have done a much, much better job of it. And then, okay, and then a lot of times people wave their hands and they say, well, scene, natural scenes are scale invariant. I take a picture up close, I take a picture far away, it all looks about the, contrast distributions are pretty invariant. It's true. For this, for this, for this particular piece, for this particular metric, on the scene distributions, it's, it's, things aren't completely scale invariant overall. Um, and digging into that is a really important question. What folks in Rob de Reuter's group have done to follow up on this is they've said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We better get, we better get the inputs that the fly receives even more right. Let's make a fly eye camera and let's drive it around like a fly drives itself through the natural world. So flies wing around like mad, right? So they took this camera and they out in out in like a, a forest with the natural scene movement statistics of the fly. Fun stuff. Um, and something that we do is we try to characterize the statistics of motion in natural scenes. That's very scene dependent. And so you have to. So what what you're tr what we're trying to do in the effort to make this answer this question concrete is to curate some measurements of the natural world and then think about what's the relevant animal in that ecological niche to tie it together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely, it's absolutely true that these are really important. Ecological niche is super important. There's a field biology tradition of doing this, which takes like a few measurements and lots of notes, but is getting much more quantitative and exciting. So now people are doing um, butterflies that live in the canopy. So there, 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 Heliconius butterflies have like thousands of species. It's a beautiful thing to study, and they're in Central and South America, a nice place to visit. Um, and people look at the species that dwell in the canopy versus the floor versus the ones that are diurnal versus the ones that are crepuscular and they try to measure the scene stats for each one of them and see if that matches with their eyeball parameters. So folks are digging into that, but it's newer. Um, the first pass at it said, things are largely the same as long as you're looking at natural stuff. So some correlation structure just keeps popping out no matter what you do. And there's some beautiful papers showing that early on. They are, of course, the lower order statistics because the higher order stuff would say that's a tree and that's a flower and that's a bug and that's, a, that's underwater. But, uh, but the gross, the, so the first pass gross slice said things are the same. And, but yes, absolutely, people are trying to get more um, quantitative about it and it's, I think, the exciting thing about the physics of behavior these days is the physics of the natural ecological setting as well. Yeah. Okay, it's natural in the sense that uh, to the extent to which natural organisms like trees and engineers are solving the same problems that have to do with gravity and materials constraints, yes. And there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of natural beings in it. We've decorated ourselves in funny ways, you know, which I'm sure some alien species would love to study. Um, so is it natural or is it not? If I take a picture of this scene, there are some low order stats that will be the same. There are some that will be different. Built buildings have a lot of, a real preponderance of, of uh, horizontal and vertical edges. There's still preponderance of them in nature, but built scenes have more. So the answer is, eh, ish, not really. Okay, Michael, there was something over here. And then, but Michael first, and then, and then, and then. Okay. We totally ignored it. We utterly ignored it. We said we're stuck with it. 
Um, and we said that given that it's so simple and it's just an additive um, sort of, uh, it's, going to, it's going to screw up our decoding no matter where we are in message space, then the only thing we can do is maximize our response entry. If we're allowed to muck with Z, we can do a lot more. And there are some problems that I think I put in the, I set a homework set for today, exercise set, not homework, uh, for today that has a little bit of that in it. Matt? Oh, shoot. They're all called no, not everybody's called Michael. I was so, but are you a Mike or are you Michael? Michael. You're Michael, okay. And you're Scottish. I remember some things. Yes, and you could test if that's enough. Yes, and people have done that, and it's beautiful. And sometimes it works. For very early visual processing, you can scramble all the high order features and show that the encoding is the same. It's a beautiful experiment, and sometimes that works. I lost track. Yes, it's extremely specific to the specific neuron. If you go somewhere else in the fly brain that cares about motion, none of this works. There's, there, because then there's you know, computation that happens. This is really close to the front end. And that's why a lot of um, theorists who go into neuroscience start at the sensory periphery. But the really fun stuff is how you do the computation, the computation, the computation that drives behavior. I lost track, but. I lost track. OK. Uh, Liz, did you have your hand up? No. Uh, Debbie. <laughs> Sorry, some lag. So, with Perl doing this, did they have a reason to believe that it's a contrast and not a contrast? Yes, they already knew that these cells responded to contrast um, ag against the mean luminance, that they did some amount of luminance adaptation. So, there's some scene invariance. You know, when we go outside, we have some you know, sort of brightness adaptation. It's not complete, but it's pretty good. And so they knew that this contrast variable was important. So they had a place to start. And it was 1D, which made it easier. Um, John Key, then Caroline. Um, so I have some information from the internet, but like, is it specific to one neuron? Like, I know you said there's Oh, yeah. Is it no, but OK, go ahead. Yes. Yes. So if I were to propagate or aggregate a couple of neurons, obviously like, I would assume that my information gain goes more just because like there's information in the data set that's of scale. But like uh, so Yeah, no we concretely, but like Let me give it can I give it a shot? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So when we've said response, I've sort of cartooned it as one neuron. You could have it be a population response, and then it's up to you to define what the bins are. And it could be phase difference. It could be bins of phase difference between neurons. It could be binary patterns in time from one neuron, binary patterns across a population. And, and as long as there were discrete, or there was a set of discrete response states, all of this would follow through. But you'd have to guess at what the response meant. Um, and when you start doing info theory, when we go beyond, you know, sort of some one, so, so you, you could see if we, have, if we have two neurons and they go zero to R max and zero to R max, and now it's, we want to do both of them, now we've got squared number of bins. And if we want to add a third, we get an exponential explosion in the no, number of states we need to consider, because maybe it's this one low and this one high and this one medium and this one something else, and we need to enumerate all of them, unless we have some model about what part of their correlation matters. And that's a big, a whole other topic that I'm not covering. OK, I saw more questions. Caroline had one. Um, Isabella has one. And then we're going to move on and look at a little bit more data and wrap up. Do you still have a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this may be a little separate, but yep. with this whole like, natural scene statistics and scale invariance stuff, yeah. Like, I don't know how to put that in the 
is that like there are scales of objects that I interact with. Like yes. The story that like Mal and Mercy has that like a fly will meet with a block. Yep. Uh, and there are smaller. You can take a picture there and like. There are yeah. But the fly, okay, right. So the so what you're saying is that at some at some scale scale matters. At some at some interaction distance scale all of a sudden matters. When people usually make this appeal to scale invariance of scenes, what they're talking about um, is not that you know there are objects on lots of different scales. The world isn't really fractal, but they try to appeal to that. But um, when you're viewing a scene, you're getting a 2D projection onto your retina. And objects can have many, many different depths and many different sizes. And we have a kind of uh, size invariant recognition of objects. Like I recognize you here, or if we're talking face to face, or if you're walking across the quad, I might, have, I might know you well enough to know your gait and say, Caroline's over there. So that's a bad example because it's not about your image stats of your face. But you know, the, the, the idea there, I think, is more about the fact that we have invariant processing of objects and scenes independent of depth. But you're absolutely right that there are, there are limitations to this and there are, scales, there are scales that matter. And I think that that gets into the, you know, sort of these, this is early in the visual system and downstream you do object recognition. And I have neurons that fire when I see each one of you now because I've learned all your faces. Right? So I have a I have a face cell for Alex, right? That's really in there, and <laughs> and and so on and so forth. So, um, I think some of those appeals don't apply, especially even with a simple thing like a fly when it's doing a behavior. And the olfactory environment is really important for that. So, yeah. Okay, Isabella, and then we're going to move on. Oh no, this is an instantaneous input output function, but memory and all of that and hysteresis and stuff like that's really important. Um, and we'll, we're going to touch on that tomorrow a little bit. Okay, let me take you through a few more things about efficient coding and efficient adaptation. So here's a diagram of some work from Rob de Reuter. So this is a different Brenner et al. paper. So you can, or maybe part of the same. Uh, so this is the visual system of the blowfly. And this is responding to um, horizontal motion. So the blowfly has two neurons that do this, which is fantastic. And they have a great big um, axonal arbor that you can record from and see what their processing looks like. So you can stick like a pole, the back of the fly head, hit the H1 arbor, and record how it senses horizontal motion. So motion that goes like this. And the, the, the H1 neurons um, are on either side, and they respond to motion that's this way, but not that way, or that way, but not this way, and whatnot. So um, you can actually take, this is one of these first awake behaving recordings that Rob did. You can put the electrode into the fly H1 neuron, and then you can rotate it, the whole thing, the recording apparatus and everything, up to um, velocities that are like hundreds of degrees per second. So you can wing it around really fast. And what they were able to do was to present stimuli that varied by uh, an order of magnitude in the velocity, but had the same sort of structure, and show that there was rapid adaptation so that the neuron's response always uh, fell in the same range and used all of its bins equally, which is pretty remarkable. So, there's ra so th this whole thing we said about you should, you should have an input-output function that is like the CDF of your input distribution. What if your input distribution rescales, gets like a bigger variance? What should you do? Well, you should stretch out your input-output function. And what they're able to show is that's exactly what the neurons do, and so that they have kind of an invariant representation of these um, velocity inputs. So here is normalized velocity. And they had a mean of 4.6 degrees per second, but also a mean of 2.3 uh, degrees per second. And they just rescaled them. And this is the firing rate of the neuron in black and white to those two massively rescaled uh, velocity distributions. And it's pretty much the same um, input-output function 
uh, sorry, the same response. They've rescaled their input output function. So if I take, you know, sort of 18 degrees per second, 36 degrees per second, 90 degrees per second, 180 degrees per second, imagine, imagine putting up a like a single re recording from a single neuron very, very carefully in a brain and then spinning it. You just would, you wouldn't let anyone do that, but you know they did it and it works. And what they're able to show is that the normalized uh, rate here by the um, distribution of different uh, velocity input velocities. If I rescale the input input velocities by the variance, I get uh, data collapse. I get that the input output function of the firing rate of the neuron is the same. So when the distribution shifts width, the response changes concomitantly. And you're able to show that the amount of rescaling that the fly brain does is the optimum. Come on. For information transmission. So they measured a particular, this is the, this is the input output function is that sigmoid that Gaussian is like the velocity distribution that's input and they just tried different input output functions and showed that as they rescale the slope of that input output function the peak information transmission was at the one that they measured yeah simon one question I have for that yeah. why is it so sort of cross brain it, it, to me it would seem like that's a sort of simulation you just scratch the function and you're able to do that with a lot of factors so oh you have a few Oh, I don't know why they didn't simulate more. This is this is just a calculation they did. I'm not. I'm not, I, I don't know. I think that people have done this a little better, but yeah, this this you can understand why they only did a few. You've got to you've got to fly and a limited. I mean, even if you can hold them for days, it's a limited amount of time. Um, last couple experimental facts. Um, all of this also breaks down. Like I said, if the noise is if there's if there's different amounts of noise and different response bins. So if the noise is dependent on how much you're responding. So if I'm responding at 100 spikes per second, I might have less noise than if I'm responding at one spike per second. And maybe I have the most noise if I'm responding at 10 spikes per second. There could be some noise distribution. And Rob de, de Reuter and Simon Laughlin basically um, showed what the solution looks like so that, you get, um, so that you get optimal information transmission. And it's basically a water filling analogy here. So here they've, they've, we've done the Fourier transform. So we're looking at response in frequency space, and this is the noise level. So you have noise, higher noise, at high and low frequencies of response. And what they're basically saying here is that you have a, if you have a certain amount of power you can put through that neuronal system, then you should use, use the lowest noise parts of the response first. And then as you have more power, you can stretch into these noisy bits. So it's like a water filling analogy. And that will give you a uniform distribution of response across the parts that are most reliable first. And then you fill it up. Um, there, we're skimming the details here. Here's another important thing on natural scene stats, and I think this is beautiful. So this is in the lateral geniculate nucleus of a cat. This is part of the visual system. After the retina, the information goes to lots of different parts of your brain. One of the main relay stations is the thalamus. And that's where it goes before it hits visual cortex. So young Dan from Berkeley uh, was able to record um, the, the output power of the neurons as a function of frequency when she played natural stimuli. And what I hope you can see here over many experiments in many different neurons, that this is a pretty flat output function. This is that whitening story we're talking about. Whitening means flattening. So if you want your output distribution to be, to be flat, that ma we have a theory in our head that says that maximizes information transmission. When young Dan probed the LGN with natural images, just flash natural images, she got an output from the neurons that was pretty flat. Now, she wasn't measuring the input-output function, and she didn't know about the natural scene stats, because it's complicated. But she could skip to the end and say, well, if I show natural scenes, is my output response flat, whitened? Then she showed the stimuli that neuroscientists at the time typically showed their subjects, which were these checkerboard white noise stimuli, 
where it's a random pattern of black squares and white squares. And then the output response was not flat at all and varied a lot between neurons. So here, the neurons are all pretty much the same in their output power spectrum. And here, they're very different. So this was sort of indirect evidence that there's something special about natural scenes. There's something special about the encoding writ large uh, of the natural scene stats. And now what could you do? You could do this experiment again where you add or remove different correlation structure in those natural scenes to try to guess what matters to the LGN. And people have played around with that. Um, so this is the intro to efficient coding in the brain. And what we're going to do next in the next lecture, final lecture, is to try to add in constraints that have to do with this uh, downstream processing, that have to do with um, what am I going to do with this information? What are my computational goals? How do I think about what matters um, to the organism more explicitly? Not just encode everything as efficiently as possible. Um, and I think I'm just going to end there. Thank you.